today on Top Shelf Sports. The Huskies take on the 19th ranked San Diego State Aztecs. We'll preview the matchup. The men's soccer team has a new coach. And we bring in Northern Star reporter Crystal Megan to recap the women's soccer season. Top Shelf Sports starts now. And I'm Austin Hansen. We have a pretty big show in store for you all with a variety of NIU and nationwide sports coverage. But let's kick it off with some Husky football. The football team faces a big test this weekend when they take on the 19th ranked San Diego State Aztecs on Saturday. The Huskies are looking to keep their momentum from their big win against Nebraska Huskers two weeks ago, despite coming off their bye week. The Husky defense has been dominant so far this season, allowing just 50 points through three games on the year. Defense has also scored on two interceptions this season, with a total of six picks. Sophomore Daniel Santa Canarita will be starting quarterback for the third straight game and is 3-0 as the Husky starter in his career. Game time is set in San Diego for 9.30 p.m. Central Time. Our sports reporter Scott Nickel met up with running back Jordan Huff during the bye week to discuss the Huskies' season thus far and also discuss this weekend's game against number 19 San Diego State. Thanks guys, I'm here with NIU running back Jordan Huff, who's coming off of a 16 carry, 102 yard performance, including a game winning touchdown. Uh, Jordan, while you're on a roll like that running the ball, are you going back to the huddle asking to be fed it more? Or? Well, yeah, there's always that sense of you want the ball more and try to want to take the game over and uh, just help lead your team to a victory. So definitely I ask for the ball more at times, but I take the plays that I'm giving and do the most with it I can. Uh, what's the feeling like when you're in the huddle and Daniel Santa Catarina calls a victory formation in front of 90,000 Nebraska fans? I mean, yeah, it's a, it's a great feeling knowing uh, what we accomplished and everything, but we just kind of took it as another win and uh, just was ready to get back at it and uh, get ready to work again because we got San Diego State coming up next week. Um, so explain that feeling in the locker room after the game. You know, What was Coach Carey's uh, – post-game speech like for you guys? Yeah, I mean, it, it was a great feeling. Anytime you can come in after a game and do our, our victory uh, song and whatnot, it's always a great feeling. And uh, he didn't really have a, a, a big after-game speech. He was kind of congratulated us and said, all right, well, we're going to come in tomorrow, get ready to work, and uh, that's what we're doing right now. Uh, so changing gears here a little bit, you were a redshirt freshman when Jordan Lynch was a senior here and a Heisman finalist. Mm -hmm. So what's it like having him back in DeKalb, you know, as a running back, backs coach, no less? Yeah, I mean, it's always great. Um, I knew Lynch in 2013. Uh, we, I was able to get to know him then. And having, having him as my coach now is really no difference. It's kind of more buddy-buddy more than anything because uh, we, well, not really grew up together, but we known each other for a while and played together. So we have that aspect to it. but. I mean, he's, he's a great coach. We get our, get our work done, and uh, he really pushes us to get better every day. Has he brought a different uh, perspective to the field since uh, he was a quarterback while playing here? Yeah, he definitely has. He, he shows us what we need to look for as far as pre-snap pre reads and whatnot and different things that we should look at that we probably haven't in the past. So looking ahead to San Diego State, um, you guys lost 42-28, I believe, in Husky Stadium last year. But uh, they lost some key guys, including Donnell Pumphrey. Um, so what's the key to a road victory to, in San Diego? Really just attack it like any other week. Just um, come in ready to prepare and to learn, learn, them and learn their tendencies and film study, uh, learn the reads when it, we come, when it comes time to practice and whatnot. So I mean, we're just going to attack it like another game, no matter who we play, and uh, just be ready to go. Yeah. The confidence level for you guys has to be pretty high coming off that victory. Uh, so what you know? What what does a victory like that do just going into a big game like this against San Diego State? I mean, it definitely helps having that confidence and whatnot, and we definitely want to keep that momentum rolling. So uh, yeah, just ready to go in there with confidence and ready to execute. Nice. All right, thanks for joining us today, Jordan, uh, and good luck in San Diego. Uh, back to you guys. 
The women's volleyball team fell to the Bowling Green Falcons in their first five-set match of the season last Saturday. The Huskies were highlighted by freshman outside hitter Kaylee Martin, who recorded a career-high and season-best 34 kills. NIU started the match strong, winning both of the first two sets, 25-20. The team could not keep the momentum going, however, losing the final three sets, 25-23, 25-21, and then finally 15-13. The Huskies will continue their season at home today against the Eastern Michigan Eagles at 7 p.m. The game will be held at the Victor E. Court in DeKalb. The NIU men's soccer team faced off against the UIC Flames early this week and could not keep up with the win. After UIC takes the lead, Conrad Ziedzik comes up with a spectacular save to keep the score close. NIU answered UIC in the second half as Jan Mertens <laughs> would go on to score over UIC goalkeeper Sawyer Jackman in the 67th minute. The Flames regained the lead 84 seconds later after UIC forward Max Todd would score on a free kick giving them a 2-1 lead. UIC would add an insurance goal in the 76th minute by Peter Beck. The Flames would go on to defeat the Huskies 3-1. NIU looks to bounce back next week when they take on Valparaiso University. We now go to Top Shelf Sports reporter Ricardo Segura, who had the chance to meet with the new men's soccer coach. I got to speak with the men's soccer team head coach, Ryan Swan, on joining the Huskies this year and what he's looking forward to with this young team. The NIU men's soccer program has some new faces on the coaching staff this year after a few changes during the offseason. Early in the year, the Huskies named Ryan Swan as the new head coach. Before joining the soccer program, Swan coached at Drury University in Missouri for eight seasons and looks to bring his expertise and energy to NIU. I've been familiar with the program for a number of years, just uh, you know, running across some of, the, some of these guys on the recruiting trails. I, I knew the, the old coaching staff, and so um, I think it's in a great location here in the Chicagoland area. There's a lot of good soccer here, and, and again, an, an opportunity to build a program back up to where it, where it was before is a, is a very exciting uh, prospect for any coach, I think. Coach Swan is very familiar with success as he has four appearances in the NCAA Division II tournament during his time as a Panther. Swan looks to continue prospering on the field with this Husky group and get them competing back at the national level. We bring like a lot of different new stuff, like uh, style of playing is really different from what we had before. We are like more offensive, we try to keep the ball a lot more than what we used to. I think it's great. At this point in the season, Coach Swan is pleased with this young Husky team and the progress they have made. Swan is confident in the abilities and drive that this team possesses against any team that they face. It's a very technical team. I think they've got the ability to, you know, possess the ball very well. And I think earlier here in the season, we've seen that. I think we've outpossessed all but one of our opponents. So, uh, from a technical perspective, I think things are, are very good. As the Huskies prepare for conference play in about two weeks against West Virginia, Swan looks to continue advancing with the help of the team's accountability and leadership. For NTC News, I'm Ricardo Seguir. The NIU soccer team will be hosting Valparaiso University next week Tuesday as they continue to prepare for conference play. Back to you guys at the desk. Thanks, Ricardo. Women's soccer looks to continue its hot start to MAC play this weekend when they take on the University of Toledo Rockets at 6 p.m. NIU has seven wins, 13 losses, and two draws against the Rockets all time, but are one and two in the, its last three matches with the visitors from Ohio. This is the second straight season that the Huskies have opened conference play with back-to-back -back victories. NIU will also play the Bowling Green University Falcons on Sunday at 2 p.m. The Huskies have 10 wins, 8 losses, and 3 draws against the all-time all against the Falcons, with the team splitting their last two matches. Joining us from the Northern Star is women's soccer beat writer, Crystal Megan. Hi. Hey, guys. So, Crystal, thank you for joining us. Um, of course. We have a few questions here for you about the women's soccer team. Uh, how has the soccer team perf performed this year in your eyes? You know, they have performed well. Back-to-back uh, -back road wins to open up conference play is huge. Uh, you know, playing in Buffalo is tough. Uh, you know, under head coach Sean Burke, they've only lost two home games prior to NIU's win last weekend. So to do that, to go in there and beat them, not only beat them, but shut them out was huge. Do you have a question? What do you expect for the upcoming weekend? You know, this upcoming weekend, they're playing Toledo and Bowling Green. Uh, Toledo's leading uh, goal scorer has scored in each of the past three games. Their goalkeeper, the freshman, actually made a career high 10 saves uh, against Mac favorite Ball State last weekend. 
on the flip side, and I use goalkeeper, Amy Anoa picked up her 300th save last weekend. So it should be a nice battle with Toledo tonight, but both matches this weekend are uh, pretty winnable for NIU. Um, so what makes this season's team different from last season's team? Depth. They have a lot more depth this season. Uh, ten different players have scored for them this season, and of those ten players, seven of them got their first collegiate goal or their first goals as Huskies. And that's a tribute to the coaching staff going out and recruiting players and also developing the ones that they already have. Wait, so what players really stick out to you this season? Kylie Dominguez is a transfer from the University of Cincinnati. And you know, just watching her, her technique on the ball, it was just a matter of time before she got one to go in the back of the net. And she did it last weekend. Uh, interesting fact about her is she was actually a couple years ago selected as one of 15 players, I believe, to play for Mexico's under 17 women's national team. Wow. And so, I mean, that just tells you how good she is. And one final question, the most important one, can this team get back to the MAC championship? Absolutely, there's no reason why this team can't get back there. Like I said, they have more depth this season and defense under Coach Ross has always been pretty steady. So no reason they can't get back there. All right, thank, thank you. you so much. Thank you. Thanks for joining us, Crystal. Coming up next on Top Shelf Sports, we'll discuss what head Bears head coach John Fox had to say about the recent game against the Packers. And we'll see if the Cubs could end the St. Louis Cardinals playoff hopes. 40% of food in America never gets eaten. When we start to think differently about our food, we can get a lot more out of it. Yes, but see you don't have a college degree. Well, no, but Okay, I can. well, wait, wait. Before you skip over me, can you at least hear me out? No, I do not have a college degree, but I've been working two jobs since the age of 18. I've been doing internships while raising my little brother, and any moment that I can spare, I'm studying, just, just trying to better myself. Okay, I'm ready for this. Wow. I'd love to hear more. Look beyond the resume and discover new ways to develop great talent at gradsoflife.org. After 15 years of smoking, Eva Marie quit. There's a new lung cancer screening that could save her life. You stopped smoking, now start screening. Learn more at savedbythescan.org. You made your house a reality. Homeschooling yourself on loans, color coding listings, and flushing every toilet in a 20 mile radius. If you can ace house hunting, you can do it for retirement. Get on track with tips at aceyourretirement.org. The men's golf team wrapped up play last weekend at the Northern Intercollegi Intercollegiate with a sixth place finish. NIU junior Thomas DeMarco finished eighth place overall and shot four under par for the tournament. This was their first home event since the 2017 NCAA Division I National Championships back in May, and the team will be back in action on October 1st at the Aaron Hills Intercollegiate Tournament at the Aaron Hills Golf Course, which was the site of the 2017 U.S. Open in June. The women's golf team finished fifth at the Mary Fossum Intercollegiate Invitational last weekend. Junior Brielle Ward finished in the top 15 with a score of 73, coming in her second round. Junior Kelly Anderson finished in the top 25 and has finished in the top 25 in every event so far this season. The team will head west for the UC Irvine Invitational on October 30th in Santa Ana, California. We had a big week in national sports. Let's head over to the Sports Hub with Top Shelf Sports reporter David Sivia. The Sports Hub, I'm David Sivia. It has been a busy week in sports, so let's go ahead and get started. The Chicago Bears and Green Bay Packers renewed the longest running rivalry in football. The Bears traveled into Lambeau Field with a, uh, with a one and two record to try and knock off Aaron Rodgers in the green and gold. It was a rough game early as the Bears found themselves down quickly. In the first quarter, Mike Glennon doesn't feel the pressure coming off the edge. Clay Matthews comes up with a huge strip sack Packers defenders jump on the fumble and take over at the three-yard line. Aaron Rodgers does what he does best and turns the turnover into points by finding Randall Cobb in the end zone, extending the Packers' lead to 14.
Cobb finds the end zone a week after sitting out with a chest injury. Rodgers loves to have him back. Glennon had a string of drives that he'd like to get back. Glennon doesn't expect the snap, causing a fumble and a Packers recovery. The very next drive, Mike Glennon overthrows his wide receiver and it is picked off by Ha Ha Clinton Dix. Surely a second quarter, Mike Glennon wishes he could get back to help the Bears get back on track. Ha Ha Clinton Dix returned the ball uh, roughly 15 yards, giving uh, Packers putting it into Bears territory. We go to the third where we find the Packers finding themselves in the red zone again where Aaron Rodgers connects with Jordy Nelson to put the game out of reach for Chicago. Nelson drops to a knee, just plays after wide out Devontae Adams was carted off the field after a nasty hit by Danny Trevathan. The Packers end up winning 35 to 14. Obviously a very poor performance. Um, you know, I think it starts at the top. I think we got out coached. We got outplayed in every area. Um, you know, we've got a lot of work to do. Fortunately, we have a mini buy here, uh, 10, 11 days to evaluate, um, do things necessary to, for us to improve. And, uh, you know, that's across the board. The Cubs clinched their second straight Central Division title Wednesday night. We'll send it to Cubs radio announcer Pat Hughes for the title clinching play. And the Cubs are headed to the postseason, it would appear, in just a moment. Fly ball to deep center field. Back goes Martin at the wall. He's there. He's got it. And the Cubs win the Central Division. We'll hear from Cubs manager Joe Madden after the big win. And the part about our group I've always loved is the authenticity. I think authenticity plays every day of the week, everywhere you go. And I really believe we have an authentic group. The Cubs season continued last night as they look to knock off the Cardinals out of the wild card hunt. We'll pick up late in the 11th inning when Cardinals infielder Paul DeJong tries to tie it up with a deep drive to center field, but Lonis Martin makes a spectacular catch to end the, to end the Cardinals' playoffs host for 2017. The Cubs won a 2-1 game where they started three catchers. The National League Divisional Series begins for the Cubs next Friday against the Washington Nationals. We move to the south side where the White Sox are wrapping up their series with the Los Angeles Angels. We start in the fifth inning where Yolmer Sanchez drives in Reimer Liriano and Adam Engel to cut the Angels' lead down to one. Sanchez now has 58 RBIs on the season. From there, we go to the eighth inning where Rob Brantley puts a charge into the ball, sending it deep over the wall to tie the game at four. This was Brantley's first home run of the season and sixth of his career. Later in the inning, Reimer Liriano at it again, finding the gap in the left side of the infield, driving home shortstop Tim Anderson from first to give the Sox the first lead of the ball game, and they wouldn't look back from there. We go on to the ninth with Juan Minaya on the mound. Minaya goes three up, three down for the close out, to close out the game. This was Minaya's eighth save of the season. The win gives the Sox 68 on the season. The Angels have dropped nine of their last 11 and are out of wild card contention. Earlier this week, 12-time All-Star and three-time NBA champion Dwayne Wade was officially waived by the Chicago Bulls. The 35-year-old shooting guard signed a one-year, $2.3 million deal with the Cleveland Cavaliers. Wade will reunite with his former Miami Heat teammate LeBron James. During their four seasons together in Miami, the superstar duo went to four straight NBA Finals appearances, winning two championships in back-to-back -back seasons. It's been three seasons since they've played together, but the Cavs are early season favorites to reach the NBA Finals this year. LeBron James is surely happy to get Dwayne Wade back. Now we go to the Blackhawks, who traveled to the Little Caesars Arena in Detroit to take on the Red Wings in the original six preseason action. Picking things up in the second period, Detroit gets on the board with first redirect goal from Michael Rasmussen. With the Hawks down one, Artem Anisimov goes between the legs of the defender, but it was not able to score. A nice nifty play there. Later in the period, Captain Jonathan Taze sets the table for Richard Panic, 
to tie the game at one. Panic with a nice shot on goal, gets it past the Detroit goalie to even it up. Two minutes later, the Red Wings answer with a goal from Libra Sulak to give Detroit the lead. Early in the third period, the Hawks continue their great passing, and Tommy Wingles lights, up, lights the lamp to tie the game at two. The Hawks wouldn't look back from there, as they would continue to move the puck with a goal from a Alex Debrecon to give the Hawks their first lead of the game. With the clock winding down, the Hawks get the empty netter to dagger the game, send them home, and get the win. The final score was 4-2. to two. The Blackhawks season opener next, begins next Thursday against the defending Stanley Cup champion Pittsburgh Penguins. I'm David Sivia, and that's it from the Sports Hub. Thanks, and back to you guys at the desk. Thanks, David. After the break, it was another Toyota-dominated race in New Hampshire. We'll recap this week in NASCAR. And we find out which Husky athlete goes above and beyond, on and off the field, in our first leader of the pack. College years possible. Opening that education savings account when she was little, spearheading campus tours, and deciphering financial aid. If you can ace planning for college, you can do it for retirement. Get on track with tips at aceyourretirement.org. It takes less than one minute to find out if you may have prediabetes, and you can do it here. So what are you waiting for? Just go to the site. My parents weren't fluent in English, so in school, I had to be independent and take initiative, and that's how I handle every project I get. One in six seniors faces the threat of hunger, and millions more live in isolation. America, let's do lunch. Drop off a hot meal and say a quick hello. Volunteer for Meals on Wheels by donating your lunch break at americaletsdolunch.org. Hi. You think you're probably sober? Yeah. But you're thinking about taking the back roads home just in case. Why would you do that? Probably OK isn't OK. Call a cab, a car, or a friend. Good choice. Welcome back to the final part of the show. NASCAR is back in action. And our very own Brandon Morocco has the latest on the upcoming season. Thanks, guys. Last weekend, NASCAR headed to New Hampshire for the second race of NASCAR's playoffs. Loudon has been a track dominated by Toyota the last four races. This Sunday was more of the same. So let's head to the track and see what happened. Kyle Busch led the field to green and was pulling away from Martin Truex Jr. He was able to reel him in though and take the lead. Truex went on to win stage one for his 19th stage win of the season. On the last lap of stage two, Kevin Harvick got into Austin Dillon and spun taking out Kurt Busch as well. Truex was involved in the crash and sustained some damage. <laughs> Kyle Busch somehow scraped by through the smoke and won stage two. Busch pulled away in stage three holding off Lars Larson, Kenseth, and even Truex who had fought his way back from the damage. In the end, no one ended up getting around Bush, and he took home the win. Bush advanced to the next round with that win. Also advancing to the next round are Kyle Larson and Brad Kozlowski based on the points. So this weekend, NASCAR heads to Dover, Delaware. This, is, this will be a big race because it's an elimination round of the playoffs, which means four drivers will no longer be eligible for the championship. Um, Kurt Busch um, almost needs a win after this last Sunday because of his DNF. Casey Kane, Austin Dillon, Ricky Stenhouse Jr., and Jamie McMurray, they also need another good race to keep their championship hopes alive. So as far as the winner, I'd say um, it'll be hard to beat the Toyotas. Kyle Busch and Truex led all but one lap at New Hampshire. So, I, But I think if anyone can do it, it'll be the guy who's challenged them all season. That's Kyle Larson. So it, it's, it's a great battle shaping up between these three, and I can't wait to see what happens. So thanks for watching. I'm Brandon Morocco, and we're going to send it back to you guys at the desk. Thanks, Brandon. The UFC returned to, J to Japan for a free fight night. Adam Carr has that and more in the fighting world in this week's MMA discussion. That's right, guys. The Land of the Rising Sun hosted UFC Fight Night St. Prue versus Okami last Friday. 
Yushin Okami returned to the UFC after being cut four years ago. He fought former title challenger Ovin St. Preux in the main event. The man known as OSP was scheduled to fight former Pride Middleweight Grand Prix and UFC light heavyweight champion Mauricio Shogun Hua. The Japanese wrestler stepped in as a last second replacement for Shogun as he came down with an injury a week before the fight. Okami tried to play to his strengths, shooting on St. Preux for the takedown. This played right into OSP's game as he stuffed the shot and set up the rarely seen Von Flew choke to put Okami to sleep. This is the second straight fight the number six light heavyweight has won on the Von Flew choke. Future opponents are going to have to be on the lookout for the sneaky submission. Early on the card, former lightweight champion Takanori Gomi took his fifth stoppage loss in a row against Dong Hyung Kim. Two former title challengers went to a decision as Jessica Andrade dominated Claudia Gajelia for the win. And finally, Gokan Saki did what you expect the former kickboxing champion to do in his UFC debut and knocked out Henrique Da Silva with that left hook. Bellator 181 featured former UFC lightweight champion Ben Henderson taking on Patricky Pitbull in the main event. Ben Henderson has been on a recent string of decisions dating back to the end of his UFC contract. He went into this fight dropping his last contest to Michael Chandler for the Bellator lightweight championship. Pitbull is coming off a big knockout over former UFC fighter Josh Thompson. In what may not be too much of a surprise at this point, another Bendo fight went the distance. After a back and forth contest between the top lightweights, Pitbull took the decision, positioning himself well for a lightweight title shot. The main card also featured striker Paul Daly landing his patented left hand to stop fellow welterweight Lawrence Larkin. Roy Big Country Nelson won his Bellator debut against Javi Ayala, and Aaron Pico bouncing back from the loss on his pro debut with a KO win over Justin Lin. I am Adam Carr, and this has been your MMA discussion. Back to you guys at the desk. Thanks, Adam. The name Santa Catarina may be familiar to fans of football, as it's a name that's been passed down within the program. Mateo Avila caught up with the newest member of the Santa Catarina legacy for this week's Leader of the Pack. NIU quarterback Daniel Santa Catarina's Husky blood runs deep and he has grown as a leader because of it. His brother Michael played football for the Huskies for four years and helped lead NIU to a bowl game back in 2014. Daniel watched his brother closely and has used him as a mentor and an inspiration. My brother, uh, he, I looked up to him my whole life. Uh, I remember at like dinner, he would order something and I would always want to order the same thing he did. And uh, that was, the same thing was true for uh, sports, you know, anything he did I wanted to do. And, and it turns out I went to the same uh, college as him, and I'm kind of following his footsteps. Despite a quiet demeanor, Daniel showed signs of leadership by enhancing his own skills, by taking constructive criticism, and working hard to make changes to his game. A lot of kids are loud and are always talking. A lot of kids are quiet. He's very quiet. But then every time you say you did this, correct it and do this, he applied the teaching and wanted the right information, which told me all I had to know about it. The quarterback position has been a highly contested one across the board, but Daniel hasn't let that get in the way of his team's success. In fact, he says the relationship is different from what the average fan may believe. It's probably weird for people outside of the, uh, of the relationship to understand with, uh, with the quarterbacks, but it's, it, it's not like you would think. It, it's, that's, that's one of my best friends, and no matter who's on the field, we are uh, <clears throat> really supportive of each other and help each other. In just his second eligible season, Daniel is now starting for the Huskies and has led NIU to some huge wins so far this season, including a win against Big Ten opponent Nebraska. Daniel's hard work ethic, along with his selflessness towards his teammates, leaves him as this week's leader of the pack. For NCC News, I'm Mateo Avila. Mateo got a chance to sit down with NIU Husky quarterback Daniel Santa Canaria earlier this week to talk about his progression and the team's impressive start to the season. Mateo. Thanks guys. So like most freshmen, Daniel was registered his first year here to get better acclimated to college. So Daniel, going from a red shirt to now the starting quarterback, what are your thoughts about where you've gotten now? Um, it's been a, a long two years. Uh, the red shirt process, that's for sure. Uh, what mo like you said, most people go through, it's, uh, it's tough. It's, it's you, you go in, you want to you want you want to play obviously like everybody and and it, it's a tough year to get acclimated but you need it you know you, you got 
in Carmen, you basically got your high school body still, and you got to get acclimated to the, to the D1, uh, to, to the level of play. So it's, it's a good year to, to take, for sure. And you mentioned to me previously when we spoke last that you're a very busy guy. Um, how do you balance class schedules with training and practice schedules? It's really hard. Um, you just get it done, though, you know. You, you know like today, I, I had a couple tests t t today, and I have one tomorrow, and I have a project due Monday, and I have to play the game Saturday. And I, I was kind of feeling sorry for myself, and I was like, come on, you know, I, I, I just, just, you just gotta fight through it, and there's, and there's no whining, you know. So I just gotta. What I do is, what we do is, a, a lot of people would would have would want to play football for us. So so you know, you just gotta suck it up a lot of times. And you guys are coming off a big win against Nebraska. What were your expectations going into that game as the underdog? Uh, we honestly didn't think we were an underdog. We maybe other people did. We didn't. And that's we respected Nebraska um, a ton, but we just we didn't. We thought we were the better team, and that's how we. Going almost every game, so well we do going every game thinking that. If, you, if you're not thinking that, then you're gonna get uh, you're gonna get beat. Yeah. And like you said, you respect Nebraska. You have <coughs> another respectable opponent coming this weekend with 19 ranked mm -hmm. San Diego State. Um, what are you guys looking to do to carry the momentum from the Nebraska win into this weekend? Um, just take care of our business. Uh, just same same approach as always. Just just execute the game plan and hopefully uh, just just win the game just by listening to our coaches and doing what they tell us and not trying to do too much. And uh, so like we said, you were registered. Um, now that you're the starting quarterback, do you have any <laughs> words of inspiration to football hopefuls looking to make the leap to D1 football? Um, just keep keep uh, doing what you do. You know, it's, uh, it's a long process and just have fun really. It's, 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 a, it's just a sport at the end of the day. So just, just have fun with it and see where it takes you. Well, thank Daniel, I want to thank you for joining us, and let's send it back to you guys at the desk. It's time for our favorite segments of the show. We toss it over to Kobe Price for insight on fantasy football and some of the best in-game action throughout the week. Thanks, guys. With week four of the NFL season approaching, it's time to take a look at our three sleeper picks for fantasy football. The quarterback to be on the lookout for is the Houston Texans' Deshaun Watson. After having a great showing against the defending Super Bowl champion, New England Patriots, in Week 3, Watson will be going against the Tennessee Titans in their suspect pass defense. Expect to see big numbers from Watson this weekend. Now, a running back looking to have a great week is Leonard Fournette of the Jacksonville Jaguars. Although he hasn't made a lot of noise in fantasy football world so far, fans ought to expect Fournette to have his breakout game this season against the Jets, who have an abysmal rush defense. And the wide receiver that's looking to tear it up this week is Doug Baldwin. Even though he's nursing a growing injury, ESPN's insider Adam Scheffner stated that Baldwin is expected to play against the Colts this weekend. Look for Walt Baldwin to show out against a Colts defense that struggles against the pass. Now it's on to the top five plays of the week. Coming in at number five, Los Angeles Sparks guard Chelsea Gray shows the world that she has the clutch gene. She catches the inbounds pass, goes to her left, steps back, and swoosh! earns the nickname Mamba Grave for the week and clinches the game winner of the WNBA Finals. At number four, Odom Beckham Jr. adds another play to his legendary highlight reel. He makes the left-handed grab for the touchdown over Jalen Mills, making him just another member to be OBJ. At number three, Leslie Jordan of the Cleveland Browns does his best OBJ and David Tyree impression by making the one-handed, helmet-assisted, fall-away catch against the Indianapolis Colts. From being on this Pector Scott last week, to be number three on the top shelf plays of the week this week, things are looking up for Jordan. At number two, Larry Fitzgerald shows that he still has plenty left in the tank. The 14-year veteran makes the improbable, spectacular catch over Orlando Scandrick and prove that he truly is a man amongst boys. And finally, the top play from the week comes from Rutgers tight end Jerome Washington. Nearly five years after Mark Sanchez, Sanchez gave us the historic butt fumble, Washington presents us with the monumentous but catch. Now, my name is Cody Price, and that will be it for Top Shelf Sports Top 5 Plays of the Week. Now let's send it back to the desk. That concludes our first show of the semester. We hope to see you again next week. Top Shelf Sports is produced and directed by students here at Northern Illinois University. For more on Top Shelf Sports, look us up and like us on Facebook, and you can also check out our new Twitter site, at Top Shelf underscore NIU, to keep up with the latest sports content. 
want to thank you all for watching, and as always, Go, Go Huskies! Huskies.